Hello everyone, good afternoon. So today I'm gonna talk about how to track video watch project, project progress using Elixir and GenStage. So my name is Emerson. I work as a software engineer since 1998. And I have been working with almost all languages that you can imagine, through COBOL to Java, C Sharp, ASP, ASP, PHP, CodeFusion, Ruby, Python, and now I'm working with Elixir. So I live in Brazil, specifically in Rio de Janeiro, and I'm daddy of these two little kids. Today I'm working for OLX. So OLX is the biggest marketplace to sell your used products in Brazil and also in Latin America. We are present in 40 countries around the world. And this is our office. We are based on Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, the OLX Brazil. And also OLX is for everyone, from poor people to rich people, everybody is selling their stuff on our platform. And we have a huge volume. Uh, more than 3 million Brazilians announce every month. So during this presentation, every minute I am talking to you, 10 cell phones are sold on our platform. It's very, very, very big. Previously, I was working at Global.com with online video. This is, our, this is where the product I, I, were, I was working, called Global Play. And I did a job that we had to track video watch, project, watch progress. And we started using Ruby, and then we changed it to Elixir. So imagine you have a video player, like the Netflix player. So you start seeing a TV show or movie. So when you stop and you return, uh, even if you are on the web or the app or the connected TV or Apple TV or Chromecast, whatever, you want to return the point you stop it. OK? So Netflix has this. Also HBO, YouTube, Global Play, and whatever product you are using of video, you have this feature. So. Uh, when you are dealing with low throughput, uh, that was the case when I joined Global to do this project. Every technology, any technology can solve this problem. So you can use Ruby, Python, CodeFusion, PHP, whatever, and you don't have to think much about the architecture. So you can use it almost any language and any architecture. But if you are global or YouTube or HBO or Netflix, you have to deal about some problems because you will start having some bottlenecks. In 2016, I did three blog posts. The first one was almost two years ago. Uh, that how we changed it from Ruby to Elixir to track this kind of thing. And that is the link if you want to read this blog post. And also, I did a, another blog post with the application Teardown. So you have all of explanation about the architecture. And this year, at the beginning, I wrote another blog post explaining how GenStage helped us to achieve another level of performance because the throughput increases from more than 3,000 requests per minute. And in peak times, peak times in Brazil is from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So a lot of traffic, people seeing soap operas, TV shows, and movies on Global Play. So we also have this link, too, if you want to see and read what I wrote in this year. So when you Think about how to implement a visual watch progress tracking. So the first attempt we did was to create a web app and an application on a mobile phone. 
So you have an endpoint, then you do a post, HTTP post. So you just directly write to the database. So it's the simplest implementation you can do, but it does not scale for high throughput. And we saw this because the database becomes the bottleneck. If you start writes as fast as you can to the database, they will somehow broke because the database can't scale like your application. Everybody knows that when you have a high throughput, you have to deal with problems with sharding, partition, and other stuff in the database. So the second attempt we did was to split the, the load and the throughput, putting into a message broker like RabbitMQ or you can use Regis or Kafka or whatever, and then you put a consumer, then you can consume the message and write to the database and you can control the back pressure like this. So the problem with this is for simplest use case, you need a lot of external components. So it's more things to communicate and more things to be broken. So you have to, to deal with your message broker. You have to scale RabbitMQ or Redis or whatever you are using. And sometimes you have a lot of work doing this and you don't want to focus on this because you don't need persistence. It's, it was it were our case. And you also have to deal with your daemon that is plugged to the message broker consuming the messages. So, the third attempt uh, were to find a solution that we can develop in a single unit. So how about if you have a possibility to not depend on external services to do this kind of thing and not have to directly write to the database? So you have no bottlenecks and no dependencies. That's the, the target. And the consequences, it's, it's easier to maintain and to understand because if you have a simple architecture, you don't have to deal with external things and you can rely on simplification of your architecture and it's better to maintain, it's better to understand for new people. And I guess that's why Elixir was the best fit for us and it was a good thing to Think about how to develop applications without relying on a lot of external components. So, on 2016, I was fed up. Uh, I left the Java community in 2008, and I started doing some Ruby and Rails in 2008 to 2014, 2015. So, also did some Node JS, but. I didn't find the thing I was looking when I broke up with Java and started with Ruby. Because, you know, Java is too complicated to develop simple things. Uh, I worked with Java through, from 2004 to 2009, a lot of banks and telecommunication companies. So for these fields, I think Java has a good opportunity because the integrations are all done, you just have to use. But to create the applications for the 21st century that we are doing right now, I guess we have a better option. So I migrated from Java to Ruby, uh, but you know, Ruby is slow. Ruby has a lot of problems with concurrence. Jose told a lot of times in a lot of Elixir conference. So I started thinking about well, what is the next language I can use to solve my problems? And as I said to you, I work with a lot of languages and I was working with Ruby. So in 2015, I did a freelancer using Elixir with a friend. And then it was a time to do something more serious. So when I was working in this project at global.com, uh, the third attempt, uh, became into an elixir attempt. So, as you see, uh, the HTTP endpoint and the message producer and consumer 
could be in the same unit. So I have a Phoenix HTTP server. I have a gen stage producer. I have a gen stage consumer. And everything is in the same unit and in the same application without needs any other external components to deal with it and to deal with their problems. So to not be only in the theory, I will show you some code. So I got this idea and this implementation that we use it on global.com. And I created an open source version that is in, on my GitHub. It's the production code, almost, that we use it in global.com. It's, it's been used from 2006 to nowadays. And I will show to you this implementation, the open source version. It's a not production ready, but almost. So let's just mirror my screen. And I can show you exactly uh, how to implement this. And I also have a demo version so we can see together. So this is a video player, OK? And as I said, when you start seeing some video, you expect to return at the point you stop it. So I don't know if you can see, but uh, I don't know if I have some problem with the internet. Uh, I will try to start again. So uh, what I will show to you is the, the video player uh, pinging the endpoint every second and registering the, the, the second that the user I see in the video. Then I will show the code of this implementation. Oh, I guess I have to start the, the server. So here we are. So uh, the player just loaded the, the point. I stop it. And as I start playing again, you can see here network. A lot of requests to an endpoint written Elixir that is registering the, the time the user is. Let, let me see the payload here. So you have the video ID and the seconds watch it. If I go to the other requests, 143, 145. So if I stop here, I will return from the beginning. Let me see again. Oh. You know, demo. Let's see. Let's stop and start again the server. So I will show you the details right now. I'm not sure if it's my computer or something like this. So let's go, please. Uh, 
I was just waiting. Let's turn on and turn off again. Wi-Fi here. I guess it did not get the file. I'm not sure, but you get the idea. You saw the, the video uh, touching the API. So I will just show you this implementation. So I have here a simple uh, HTTP 5 player that I have a post data function that we will post to, to an endpoint that is localhost, that is the, the Elixir application, and the progress and pass a token that some kind of user token for authentication and authorization, and video ID, and the seconds watch it getting the player current time. So Every one second, uh, it could be five or 10 seconds, whatever, the, it will touch the API, sending the seconds watched. So we can store on the database, and then when the user returns, then can return on the exactly point they stopped. So this is the, the, the time update function. It's a simple HTTP post that a, Every HTTP, HTML file, five player has a, this hook to time update every second or every five or 10 seconds. Um, the, the thing that it's interest is the Elixir part. So let's start with the controller. So we have this track progress that we get the, the parameters and we also put the last track timestamp using EOS system time. So what is this line? Imagine we have a lot of nodes and events are coming. So every time the user are touching the API, then can be through different nodes. So we have to get the timestamp to ensure that only the last event prevails. So if, if the events came out of order, that is possible and reasonable, uh, we can ensure that a oldest event never will be updated against the newest. So I will show you this, this part a little more. And then I get the user ID from the authentication. It's a fake authentication. And then I and queue the events to be processed. So this event store is a gen stage producer. I will show you. So it's a gen stage that I have the, all the boilerplate. So in the init, I start a queue. It's a simple Erlang queue. And then I have a end queue that is a cast I don't need a return. So this handle cast of in queue only get the event and put in the queue. So queue in and put the event in the queue with the timestamp I created on the controller. So this, this code is based on the example on the GenState documentation. So this dispatch events, what it does is it gets the, the events in the queue, queue out, and then the check the events. What, what is this check event? I have a configuration here and config file that has the time to leave for the events. So imagine we are in the in a high peak moment, and you are touching the API forever 10 seconds. So 
If you receive an event and you can't process for the next 10 seconds, probably a new event has arrived. So you don't need to, you don't need to process an event past 10 seconds ago. You can just throw it away and process the, the newest one. So it, it helps a lot not to, to process dirty events that can't be written to the database. So I will return here to the event store to show you. So this only checks that OS system time milliseconds is, is greater than the last track timestamp plus the seconds to, to time out, to the time to leave. So if this is true, the event is expired, so, so I do nothing. Uh, otherwise, it's valid. So if it's valid, I just dispatch the events and reduce the queue size. If it's expired, I also reduce the queue size, but I, I do not reduce the demand. So I do not send the events to the, to the consumer. So it's a simple, simple implementation. I, I just need to check if the event has expired or not and send to the consumer. The consumer is just a consumer supervisor that has a producer on the start and a processor. So the processor is the module that we write to the database. I will show you. So this is another boilerplate that it's in the GenState documentation. You configure the producer, the mean demand, and the max demand to control the back pressure. So let's see in the configuration what, what I'm using right now. Oh, it's only 2 and 10, but you can tune whatever your database uh, can achieve for throughput. And then here, it used the processor and SPAL at children and the, the supervision tree for the consumer supervisor and then has the strategy for, for the supervision. So let's show here the, the aggregator that is a simple task link that uses the, the progress store to save the event. So this module will save to the database. So, as, as the HTTP request comes, I just enqueue the event in Jane stage and use their link queue to be processed later. And when the consumer asks for, asks for, for events, for new demands, the producer will send and it will process according to the configuration for the concurrence, the mean demand and the max demand. So here I can control the back pressure to not overload the database. And also here in the event store, I can use the load sheeting. So uh, when we have peak moments and I can process the events as fast as they, they arrive, I can just throw away and just receive the, news, the newest and not overload my system and increase the queue adds infinitum. So the last part I want to show you that it's also important is, is the progress store. So it's an actor. So I create a change set is a, is a simple implementation and the repo insert, I have this conflict strategy. So what is this conflict strategy? It's important because the events came out of order most of time. So I will show you right now. The progress track has this code. So when you, when you try to, to, to insert, to save, uh, I have a strategy that says on conflict update. And it will rely on this configuration, on this instruction, that say if the last track timestamp is less than the value of, the val of what is written into the database, I update or not the seconds watched. So when the old event arrive, 
I, I will not update, only if it's newer. And also the same thing to, to write the last track timestamp to the database. So I will only update the, the, the registry when, when I'm writing to the database if the, the last track timestamp is greater than the last in the database. So if the events come out of order, I will not write to the database. And that is an important thing that when you use this strategy, that on conflict update, Acto do not update automatically the update at field for timestamps. And we discovered this the, the, hard, the hardest way. So I had to create a function here just to reproduce what the code is inside Acto. So it's, it's the same. I just copy and paste from the Acto source. I have to create the naive date time using the calendar Erlang module that I use now to date time using the timestamp. So the, the rest of the code is simple Elixir and Acto code, but the, the import parts are this. So if you are writing to the database and trying to update every time and the events came out of order, you have to, to check if the timestamp you created is greater than the timestamp that is registered in the database. So let me show you the schema here. Oh, it's in the same file. So I have the video ID. I have the seconds watched. I have fully watched. If you want to register, um, say you pass at 90%. 90% of the video, and you, you want to register that the, this video is fully watched. You can just pass a Boolean value. And we also need the last track timestamp to control the, the events that are, are coming out of order to not update accidentally to 10 seconds ago because the events came out of order. And the user ID, because you know each user is watching it, his video, so you have to, to segregate for users, so video ID and user, that is the tuple that the compounds the, the unikey. And if we go to the migration, the table is just video ID, second watch, fully watched, last track timestamp, and user ID, and we have a unique index that is user ID and video ID. So you can repeat, of course, the, the user ID sees the, the same video ID. So you have to update, not insert. And you have a, a index here just to search for user ID. So let's return to the controller. And when I need to get the progress, I just get the video ID and merge with user ID based on the authentication. And get on the progress store, that is a simple Acto query. So I get a from progress track, where video ID equals the video ID came from the JSON payload, and the user ID equals the user ID came from the authentication mechanism, and gets only the second watch it. So here in the, the simple HTML version, I get the project progress here at the beginning. Oh, well, uh, so I just get the, the URL here. Progress and video ID, one, and a valid token. And just get the response. And here on the, the cam play event from the player, I set the current time to the start time I fetched from the, the service. So the code is pretty simple. You can see it's, uh, I, I did all of this in one day, uh, this open source version. And the important thing here is I did not need a RabbitMQ, Kafka, or Redis. And this is not a proof of concept. This is working in production right now, today, on global.com, that product I, I show to you. And it's very stable. 
So you can rely on this. It's up and running more than one year, the gen stage version. So it's only these few lines of code. You have a controller, a gen stage structure, a actor model, and one database table. So it's pretty straightforward. And if you want to show, want to see and download and contribute to this code, I will show to you just a minute. And mirror again. Oh wow. Well. Let's go. So you can copy this link um, and see on GitHub and download the code and, and create whatever you want and contribute. It's almost production ready. So in the few weeks, next weeks, I'll, I will finish this and will be production ready. So it's very uh, stable and in the peak moments, we achieved more than 4,000 requests per minute uh, for the users. And with the response time, 99% chill uh, on average from 15 milliseconds. And uh, the average is less than two milliseconds because it just has to enqueue to the gen staging process so if you want, you can send the, the gen stage healthy metrics to a stats G or log stash or whatever to monitor your queue and see if things are going, are going good or no. So the, the message here is that Elixir and Erlang OTP has a lot of building blocks for us to create reliable applications and distributed applications that we sometimes and most of times do not need external services like uh, AMQP or Kafka or Redis or things like this. We can just use the building blocks that the platform gives to us and we can create things like this with few lines of code. Uh, you know, users doesn't uh, matter for them if we lost 10 seconds of the time they are watching video, then we, when they return, if they return 10 seconds ahead or behind, doesn't matter, so we can discard events. It's not uh, something that we need to persist to a storage, like a background job or things like this. So for these scenarios that you don't need persistence, you can use GenStage to do this kind of computation and processing. And the last version that we, we, we implement, uh, it was very few lines of code like this I present to you. And if you go to my GitHub, you can see that it's pretty straightforward. And so you can just implement things, wonderful things, using a few dependencies and no external services. So, if you have any questions, that's it. So, thank you very much. Do we have time? Yes, I How's it going? All right, uh, so I was curious, uh, it seems like for your use case here, um, like you mentioned, it doesn't matter if some of the, the messages get dropped, um, it's not final. Uh, if the producer crashes or goes down, Oh, probably if I need to, to guarantee the deliver, I will not use, use only the gen stage. I will put the message somewhere in a durable uh, persistence storage. Could be a database or could be a Kafka or Rabbit, I don't know. Uh, but I think the, 
the greatest thing about Gen Stage at, is that you can think about these problems um, and you can implement whatever you want using these build blocks. So I saw a talk from José in 2016 when Gen Stage was just released that he implemented a thing similar to a message broker only use Gen Stage and Postgres. So he put the message into the database uh, when the message arrives and has a producer reading for the database and sending to the consumer. So it's 100% reliable and just a simple implementation and you do not need to install anything else. So I think that the best way to, to think about these building blocks is that sometimes we are locked in the status quo and we just doing things the same way we always do without thinking in different ways. Oh, that's okay. If you want to see some code again or return to any slide. So I have a question. Uh, are post finished in the uh, gen stage running in the same node or do you have separate nodes for both of them that you have to consume that outside of the web server? Right oh, good question. So the question was if everything is together in the same nodes or we have separate nodes for gen stage and the HTTP server. So uh, before I arrived, before I arrived at global.com, before I left to OLX, it was everything together. Uh, but it's very simple to separate things. Uh, it was an umbrella application. So you can deploy a gen stage in another node and just communicate through nodes and send messages. So it, it could be this way, but uh, it was not like this. The, at least when I was there. You were talking earlier on about how the database was the bottleneck of the application. And uh, I'm not sure how much it still is a bottleneck. Uh, you've got the message queue now, um, and that helps, that helps uh, control the flow of data better. But I was just thinking about your database schema. You've got that uh, unique key on user ID and, and uh, video ID. Yeah. And then you have that conflict case if uh, you're trying to insert a record. If there's a conflict, and if there is, then you do an update. Um, unique keys, they introduce some more latency to the writes. So I was wondering if you could uh, possibly improve that by um, removing the unique key index and just inserting the record. And then um, when you, the next time you need to query to see when the video was last read, then you can just do a query that gets the latest date. Yeah, so let me show you. Uh, this is why we use this strategy. So you have one, only one round trip to the database. The first version, we do exactly what you said. We query before do the insert or update, uh, but it was slower. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a database specialist, <laughs> but we had 500 million records in this database. And probably with partition and other strategies, it could be better. But after our tests, this, this query uh, were the, the best to performance we can, could achieve. So we can argue here, but I'm not a database specialist to argue with you about this. So it, it is what worked for us, but just this. So it looks 
looks like with gen stage you uh, you optimize the flow using those two <coughs> values, min and max. Did it take you a while to figure out the right values so you weren't overwhelming the consumer or the data? Yeah, we we also had some troubles uh, with the actual pool size. So we have to tune these three values, the pool size and the min and max demands to have, uh, the, the, you know, if you put a high value to the max demand and you have a, a few connections in the pool, you will, you will also have problems uh, waiting for connections to be released to, to write to the database. So it took more than two weeks to figure out what was the best configuration because uh, it was a replacement from a Ruby on Rails application. So there were clients using it. It was not from scratch. Uh, so it, it was very complicated and very ad hoc. We had to try and see what works. Of course, you, you do some basic math to, you know, ha have some uh, connections in the pool that you can achieve the max demand. But you also have to think about uh, the database. So if we grill the max demand and the connection pool size, we started overloading the database. So we prefer to throw away some events to overload the database, and that was rare, not often. I think we are Any more questions? So I, I will be there uh, for the last uh, to, of today. If you have any questions, feel free to, to keep in touch. Thank you.